So please stick around. We will be right back. Hi, good morning everyone. Thank you for joining. This is episode number 183 and we're talking with Asby Brown. Thank you so much for joining again, Asby. It's always great to be here. Uh, today, uh, the first one, two weeks ago, we talked about SafeCast, your work as a researcher. Last week, we talked about sustainability in the Edo Jidai, in the Edo period in Japan's history. And today we're talking about your very first book, Japanese Traditional Carpentry. How did you get started with this project? This is so exciting. Well, I was lucky because when I was in university, uh, I had a, a roommate who had uh, spent a lot of time in Japan, and uh, he had some beautiful books about Japanese traditional wooden architecture, some that was very eye-opening for me. Uh, and I uh, had a, a teacher, uh, an art teacher, a sculpture teacher, who had spent time in Japan. And um, the library at the university had a wonderful collection of books about Japanese architecture. So I sort of dove into that. And, <clears throat> excuse me, I always point out to people that at the time, you know, I graduated in 1980, so that lets you know how old I am. And there were no courses at my university. This was Yale College. Even a first-rate university like that did not have any courses on Japanese architecture. So I was able to put together a tutorial, just me and the professor, uh, for my senior year, and uh, uh, basically studying Japanese architecture and aesthetics. And uh, that was really my deep dive into it in terms of theory and history. And I had wanted to come to Japan, but I just didn't have a chance until a couple of years after I had graduated. I guess it was 1983, and I was living in New York doing different things. Uh, I was an artist assistant. I was working on theatrical performances and things, and I was selected to be in a kind of festival at Seibu Department Store in Ikebukuro in Tokyo <clears throat> and, uh, and came then. And I, I poked around and asked around, and uh, I had uh, a, a former uh, – friend, you know, a, a person a couple of years ahead of me in the sculpture department at Yale who was Japanese and she had an exhibition and I stopped in to see that and I said, hey, I would love to see Japanese traditional uh, temple carpentry. It's called Mia Daiku. And she said, well, let me introduce you to my professor who will be here later and he knows about that kind of thing. And this professor kind of led me on a wild goose chase, which ended up being really fortunate. He told me that there was a carpenter named Nishioka who was working at a temple called Shin Yakushiji uh, in Nara, and uh, and that he also worked at the National Museum in Wena. And he said, I should call the National Museum and try to talk to him. So I called the museum, and I was told, oh, Mr. Nishioka is not here. He'll be back next week. As I called back, and I spoke to this Mr. Nishioka, and he said, oh, I'm a different Nishioka. The Nishioka that you know, he's at Yakushiji in Nara, and by the way, I know him. Uh, shall I call him for you? So what happened was because of this error on the part of this friend's teacher, um, the, someone from the National Museum called ahead to uh, Master Nishioka to let him know there was this American who wanted to come talk to him. So I made my way to Nara, went to Yakushiji, showed up at the temple, uh, I had an appointment, etc. And they said, oh, well, the master is here, but he doesn't speak English. And at the time I spoke really no Japanese, maybe just Ikura desu ka? And, uh, and he said, but there's a monk who does speak English, but he's out of town and he'll come back tomorrow. Come back tomorrow. And this went on for like four days. Every day I'd show up and say, oh, he's not back yet. Come back tomorrow. Come back tomorrow. So I was basically spending my days at the temple and going to Nara, other temples and showing up and sitting outside, um, you know, the workshop where the master was. And eventually the monk showed up and Master Nishioka met me and greeted me and it was just a a wonderful positive warm exchange and that sort of opened up everything for me so at the time i thought i wanted to be an apprentice a deshi to learn uh, carpentry techniques from the master uh, i was already 27 years old i had graduated you know i'd spent took time off in college i graduated kind of late and i, I was already doing my own creative work uh, but i thought maybe i could do that and uh, the master said, 
Wes, if you come back to Japan, I'll teach you. So he accepted me as an apprentice. But I started to think about it carefully because uh, I understood, you know, I knew that uh, there was a great ethical obligation for someone doing this. And I was young. I was this American kid, basically, who, you know, you try a little of this, you try a little of that. And the idea of spending seven or eight years constantly bowing my head, you know, sweeping the floor uh, and, and not really having the opportunity to do my own creative work, I thought I wouldn't be able to handle that. I thought I'd mess it up. So I went back to him and I said, you know, I appreciate the offer, uh, but maybe if you would just give me access to the site and let me document the work, that would be really fulfilling for me. And, and that's what happened. Uh, that's amazing. And mm. Nishioka Sensei is such a, like many of the carpenters that you talk about in your book, is such an inspiring person. And he is from a long line of temple carpenters, right? As you, you detail. But yes. his father was actually a farmer. And there's so mm. many connections in your book between the environment and the balance of the forest and finding the wood and things that we'll talk about later, but really fascinating. And to be an apprentice, he started from elementary school, it sounds like, right? Yes, you know, it, it's interesting because like most traditional Japanese crafts or, or even arts, um, it is a kind of like an ie moto system. It is uh, an ie, it, it is a, you know, a hereditary thing, generally speaking. And uh, his family, his, his patrilineal uh, family line had been uh, the the temple carpenters, the Miya Daiku of Horyuji Temple uh, in Nara for, for generations. But like you mentioned, his father did not become a carpenter. So he was taught by his grandfather. And yes, he began at a young age. But he was born in 1908. So this is the Meiji period. There was already compulsory education. So of course, he went through school. And his grandfather told him, uh, as he, I guess it was around the time of high school, he said, you know, uh, you can learn to be a carpenter, that's very good, but you should uh, go to college. And you should also learn uh, to be a farmer yourself, because no matter what happens, you'll be able to feed yourself. So he ended up going to agricultural school. And this is unusual, because he was a totally trained, you know, traditionally trained carpenter, who also had a scientific understanding of soil, of, of botany, of the growth of plants, of the growth of trees. And this influenced his understanding, you know, tremendously. So, uh, you know, he was kind of an unusual character in that sense. And, and you know, he, he worked on temples as a young man and, uh, you know, became, you know, a Miyadaiku, became a Torio. Uh, he worked on Horyuji mainly. Uh, including some major reconstructions, dismantling, etc., of that temple. Uh, and when the war came, he actually went to China as a soldier, uh, but was fortunate that his uh, a commanding officer understood who he was and what he, his true work was and was able to get him uh, sent back to Japan uh, to continue that. And, of course, after the war, it was a very bad time uh, for, for Japan. You know, a lot of people were starving, and uh, he was fortunate that he was able to grow his own food and survive that way. Yeah, so interesting. I love the, the mm. concepts that you lay out uh, also about mm -hmm. his idea about um, nature and trees and the way trees are grown in the mountain should be the way yeah. they reflect their position in the temple. There's so many yes. like reverences that he had in terms of the natural way and the temple way. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. It's fantastic. It was that was really one of the most enlightening things that I learned from uh, Master Nishioka. And I, I want to point out that I was lucky that I was not a deshi, I was not an apprentice uh, bound to simply be obedient. And, you know, apprentices are not allowed to ask questions, basically. Uh, they just listen. And there's still something called nusumi gekko, which is stolen lessons where, you know, rarely does someone teach you how to do things. They just say, I'm going to do this, and you watch, you know, and then maybe they'll give a little, a few pointers, a few hints, but basically you learn through observation and, and through silence uh, and through through obedience. And, um, but I was different, you know, I was again this gaijin guy, young, youngster, and um, 
was allowed to ask questions. I would make appointments and say, okay, I have all these questions. And, um, you know, why do you do things this way? Why is this little gap left uh, between these pieces of wood when it's completed? Um, you know, uh, all of these questions. He would reply in a way that reflected on something about the environment. Uh, and, and it, like you point out, it always uh, came back to the growth of trees and the life of trees and where they grew, how they grew, how their environment affected the quality and the nature and what we would call the personality of the wood. And it's interesting because a, a lot of this has to do with education and understanding education, and understanding what can be taught through a traditional apprenticeship system or this traditional, you know, hereditary teachings that is maybe difficult to teach uh, in an academic, in a school context. And uh, his family uh, has what are called kuden, and these are oral teachings. It's, it's basically, you know, sayings uh, that encapsulate the key values and there's 10 of them and one of I mean a couple of them deal with the environment one is don't buy lumber buy a mountain and the reason is that it's ideally you will be able to take all of the trees the main lumber that you're going to use for your temple from the same mountain that they'll have grown up together They've had grown up together in a very similar environment, and therefore, over time, over the centuries after the temple is completed, they are more likely to, to change in a similar way. Uh, and and one of the principles, another principle is, is to try to use uh, trees uh, in the temple in the same orientation that they grew on the mountain. So trees that were on the north side of the mountain, you should try to use on the north side of the temple, the south side, uh, the south side, etc. And this was kind of baffling to me. I, I couldn't believe that this really made a difference. But through, again, centuries of, of observation, uh, you know, Nishioka uh, was convinced that his, his forebears had, had proven that this was the case. And he, he, in his own observation, was convinced as well. So, um, again, trees that grow in the lower part of the mountain in a valley, they're more likely to be moist. It's not likely to be good wood. Uh, trees that grow uh, in, in the, the, the middle of the, um, of the slope will have to grow uh, longer with fewer branches so they can get to the top and, and, and branch to, to catch enough sunlight. Trees at the top of the mountain are more likely to be stouter. So the, the place on the mountain himself would, would affect the character of the tree. And this is something that was handed down, uh, you know, through his family line uh, for centuries and, and absolutely uh, influenced uh, the thinking and the planning of these temple projects. Wow, it's amazing. And then uh, you're talking a little bit about the process of from cutting down a tree to, uh, of course, all the detail work and all the, the things that I think of as carpentry is actually quite far down the line, You're starting with the person who cuts the tree. But even before you cut the tree, um, you had a great part where Nishioka sensei would, or Master Nishioka, would actually go to the tree before it was cut. And he would say something to the tree, like a, a kind of promise. To yeah, take a prayer, care of it. basically, a, 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 it's an apology and a promise. It's apologizing for ending the life of the tree in this way, but a promise that the life of the tree would continue uh, in a beautiful form for another thousand years uh, within the temple building. So this is reflecting a commitment to trees as a living being, as something that we depend on. And we understand now, uh, in terms of carbon, in terms of all these environmental things, th how important trees are. Uh, and uh, also need to point out that um, ideally, from the ancient times, uh, the, the, the large columns of a major temple that really required a tree that had grown for close to a thousand years, if not more, maybe maybe 600 years. So these would be very, very old living beings, uh, which, because of that, I think, deserve our respect. And I think a lot of this has to do with respect for trees and for living beings. And this this thinking, of course, is it is very influenced by Buddhism, of course, uh, the notion of reincarnation, the notion of, of the continuation of life and, and our place in the chain of that. It's also very Shinto, very influenced by Shinto, respecting these things as a, as a living being. And it's interesting that uh, the master uh, carpenter, that Nishioka, or people in his position, also are a kind of a cleric. They're also, they have kind of a religious role 
they're they're sort of spiritual leaders as much as they are carpenters. And again, this was very eye-opening to me. And you see it, of course, certainly any carpenter can pray before they cut trees, and I think quite a few do in Japan. Uh, but uh, when the temple is, is having its important uh, erection ceremonies, there's something called the Joto Shiki, where the, the ridge beam is put in place. And it's a very important thing because that's when the spirits come to inhabit the temple. And the priest, uh, the, rather Master Nishioka and his, his uh, top um, assistants, um, wear the garbs of priests, of, of, of Shinto priests, actually. And they perform small rituals as Shinto priests. So this was also very surprising to me, that they are really spiritual. And, you know, while we're on the subject, um, I, you know, I met Mr. Nish Master Nish Nishioka, and I had not been in Japan long at all, a matter of weeks. And I had not met and this elder, elderly Japanese person like that. And um, I, guess, I guess I assumed that they, everyone was like that. I thought, oh, this is probably a typical Japanese ojisan, you know. Uh, typical elderly man. And it wasn't until later that I really understood um, his uniqueness, the, the strength of his character, uh, and a kind of compassion and kindness that made me think he was actually very evolved. Uh, again, you know, if we think about it in Buddhist terms, um, that he had spent his life, he had devoted his life he, as a Buddhist to building temples. And, and, and repairing and, and maintaining temples. This was his life of devotion, and he passed that down. I don't think he ever really, he never told people they should go pray or anything like that, but he lived by demonstrating through his activity, through his behavior, through what he did, what he cared about, uh, the importance of this to him. So he was actually, I think, a devout Buddhist. And this is also one of the kuden, one of the oral teachings, is, you know, if you're not a believer, then you shouldn't be involved in this in, in any major way. You know, you have to understand what it's about if you're really going to build a temple that embodies that. So perhaps, perhaps, you know, I don't know, uh, maybe he was an enlightened person. Uh, if I, I think back sometimes, if, he, if I've ever met an enlightened person, maybe it was him. And I think I was very, very fortunate to have time and contact with him as I did. That's wonderful. You have so many wonderful stories in the book of his teachings and his personality mm. and everything and how insightful and knowledgeable he was on many different levels. So, for example, when you were planing and he could tell by the sound mm. that you weren't doing it quite right. Yes. And other carpenters were told that they were trained by the smell of the wood to know where that mm -hmm. wood came from, what forest in Japan. The yeah. level of understanding is just amazing. Yeah, and and uh, one of the things that we often love about Japanese traditional arts is a, a sense of detail and, and attention to the very, very subtle things. Maybe it's subtleties of material or color or, um, you know, maybe it's how finely things can be worked. And... I guess this is a training of perception as much as anything else. And and I think, again, it pervades most traditional Japanese arts and crafts. Uh, in the case of carpentry, like you point out, uh, Master Nishioka, he, he, yes, he could tell by the sound. Uh, whether someone's plane was had been carefully maintained, uh, you know, if he was holding it correctly, etc. Um, and yes, you mentioned the smell, where the carpenters could say just by the smell, this this uh, hinoki wood, a beautiful Japanese hinoki, was the prized wood that was used for most of this. Uh, they could tell uh, by the aroma of the wood where it was from. Uh, there were other things I remember just uh, seeing them. And again, these Japanese planes, they, they can shave off just a few microns. Literally, the plane shaving, you could hold it in the palm of your hand and see the lines of your hand through the plane shaving. And, and this, again, it's not a, a virtuoso. It's not about being a virtuoso. It's about being able to control things very, very finely. And I remember seeing, spending time with the carpenters and they're planing a board and making it flat. And you hold it up and it's like, you know, um, two meters long or something. Oh, that corner is just like two meters too tall. I said, how can you tell? How can you tell? Well, they can tell. They've trained their perception. And sure enough, they're usually right. So this is, you know, it's about attentiveness. And we talk about mindfulness, the importance of that. And I think people understand this as a concept. But carpentry for these people 
was a, a continual act of mindfulness, of paying attention. And one thing that I, I noticed, you know, I'd spend a lot of time on building sites in the U.S., you know, and be working as a carpenter myself. And you go in and there's always radio playing and people are laughing and joking and stuff. It wasn't like that in, in the workshop at Yakushiji uh, where I was doing this research. You'd walk in, it was very quiet. The only sound was the sound of the tools. Uh, it was still it was respectful. It was calm. Uh, there was no haste, no panic, no shouting. Uh, people communicated with each other basically wordlessly. Most of the things they needed to do, they could just nod their head and point to something. They'd pick up the wood. Uh, occasionally, they would have to talk. And then break time, it was just fun. They would sit around and drink their tea and have their snacks, you know. And, uh, you know, they were just lively, normal people. They would really loosen up. But the work site was a place that deserved to be respected. And, and that was something that really struck me as well. Yeah, that's amazing. I think um, before we talk more about the specifics of the tools and the styles, which mm -hmm. is so fascinating, mm -hmm. um, talking about the role of the master carpenter as a crucial peg in the system. I found that really yeah. interesting. And how it's, it's of course, it's a artistry, artisan trade, which mm -hmm. is dying out like so many traditional trades in Japan. Mm -hmm. But and you were talking about that with one of the carpenters and over at a drinking party. And he was saying, mm -hmm. you think you feel sad? Imagine how we feel. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. that. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah so. By the time I got interested in this, of course, my university time, late, you know, in the 1980s, etc., this is the end of the 20th century. And, and these, this craft, this, these techniques, the, these values had been e evolving. I mean, after basically being introduced from China and Korea uh, in the 6th century, generally, it's, it's accepted there was the 6th century, they had evolved in a very specific way for, you know, 13, 1500 years, basically. Uh, and within our lifetime, uh, it was dying out. Uh, and uh, the main reason that uh, the, the temple carpentry specifically and other fine uh, you know, types of Japanese carpentry were dying out is because um, the cost of the lumber, uh, the people are not building big projects from wood, uh, et cetera. So there's not enough people who need it. Again, you have deforestation, so um, it's hard to get the, the, the kind of wood that you need in Japan. And the and shocking thing to me was that uh, most of the main wood used in the temple project I was documenting at Yakushiji had come from Taiwan because there was not enough uh, of that hinoki in Japan. So we're using a slightly different species of hinoki. They had to make some adjustments for that. Uh, also, if there's not enough uh, top quality carpenters uh, who are doing this work, then they don't need the, the best tools. They don't need the top quality tools, which is m primarily the the blades, so whether it's chisels or plain blades. And these, you know, are carefully forged, they're hand forged, they're, they're a beautiful craft uh, in and of its themselves. But um, but then those, those uh, tool makers don't have work. So it's kind of an ecology. Uh, it really is an ecology. It's a system of interlocking parts and crafts and, and materials. And when any one of them starts to disappear or crumble, the whole thing becomes unstable and falls apart. So within our lifetime, we're seeing this craft of carpentry evaporate. And, and you know, perhaps uh, compared to when I arrived in the 1980s, there's more recognition. You know, UNESCO just uh, designated a bunch of Japanese building crafts as an intangible cultural asset, and I think uh, that's important. That may help uh, for training and getting resources for that sort of thing. But it's not never going to be like it was uh, even 200 years ago or 300 years ago. And t and Master Nishioka understood that. You know, he said he he would be lucky to barely maintain a bit of of what the his forebears understood. Uh, so, yes, I would laugh and joke with the carpenters and, and say, you know, you guys, um, you know, maybe we should freeze you for 200 years and then thaw you out, uh, you know, when the forests have returned and we're ready to start building again, you know. And we were joking and everything, but it was really sad. It was really sad. And like you mentioned, I talked to this one carpenter and he said, I said, you know, really, it, it, it was painful for me to see this, to see what they're capable of and know that, well, maybe Yakushiji might be the last big building project of buildings of that size and scale. Uh, and, and after Yakushiji, Yakushiji, there have not been. Generally, temple carpenters in Japan, they're doing repairs or making smaller buildings. And, and there's a work for, enough work like that to keep you know, 
quite a few temple carpenters, um, uh, you know, working in Japan, but they're not getting to build big projects. And in order to really be trained as a top uh, torio, as a top um, master carpenter, you need to be able to uh, plan and manage that kind of project. Uh, so no one now will have that opportunity. I, I have a hard time understanding or, 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 or seeing where that opportunity will arise. So this is, for me, a huge tragedy. And, uh, and it was sad, and yes, and the carpenters themselves, themselves said, yeah, you know, and just think how we feel. Because you know, they're devoting their lives to this and, and, and wondering who's going to value it later. Uh, yeah. So, you know, there's, and there's a lot of other reasons why, but it comes down to cultural values. Uh, and I want to point out that um, at the time when I arrived, again, early 1980s, mid-1980s, uh, and I, I guess I, I should mention I came back in 1985 with a grant from the Japanese government to go into graduate school, and I was put in a language program at Osaka Gaidai for six months, and that was great because I could go, you know, every weekend or spend a lot of time in Nara when I was doing that. Um, you know, at the time, um, there was not a lot of appreciation of what Nishioka was doing. Uh, I would talk, meet people and, and they'd say, what are you studying? I say, I'm studying Mia Daiku. And they're going, Mia Daiku, you know, what is that? Many, most people in general did not know. Uh, people who knew about him and his work tended to be either, you know, wooden architecture fans or specialists or people who were interested in temples and, and, and Buddhist Buddhism and Buddhist architecture uh, and maybe a, a few other types of people. And he had come in, for continual criticism through the media and other uh, places for the amount of time, the amount of money it cost to build uh, like he was building at Yakushiji, where they would say, well, why don't you just build in concrete? You can do it much faster and, you know, and it'll be sturdy and a lot cheaper. And, and his point of view was that's not what this is. It's not just about putting up a building. It's about building a Buddhist temple. And that requires a lot of uh, sensibility to things like time and uh, building building things to last a thousand years. So that was the, the key, that he's building for a thousand years. Yeah, absolutely incredible. That concept of building beyond your lifetime and the planning mm. of a thousand years at a time and then the temples uh, getting kind of a, a re, not really a remodel, but a reassessment every 200 years, 100 or 200 years. So each generation, they would be checked and fixed. But the idea was that these temples should last over a thousand years, mm -hmm. like many of the trees used had lived for a thousand years. And that concept yes. is so wonderful. Yes. Uh, and this was one of the more mind blowing things uh, that I learned from. Uh, Master Nishioka, uh, and and like many of the mind blowing things at the time, he told me I was interested, and later they sort of exploded, you know, in my consciousness like a you know, delayed bomb. Um, yeah, so here's a situation where Nishioka or other carpenters of that caliber uh, would be building a temple, selecting trees that were mainly, hopefully, a thousand years old. Uh, and in the case of something like, let's say, Yakushiji, uh, you know, it was built basically in the end of the 7th century, 681st, and then dismantled and moved. So we usually date it from 710. But anyway, if the, the wood is a thousand years old, the trees are a thousand years old when they were cut to build that, that means that they were cut, or rather they, they were saplings like 300 BC or something. Uh, and uh, maybe they're older. Uh, let's say it's 500 BC. Uh, and that is the time of, of, of Shakyamuni Buddha himself. That's the time of Confucius. That's the time of Socrates. Uh, this is, these are living things that were alive at the time uh, of those eras in our cultural history. Uh, and, and then they're cut and they're used in the temple. And in the case of Yakushiji, um, you know, it, had, it was built and again completed in 710, uh, but it had gone through fires, etc. But there was one pagoda, the Eastern Pagoda, which was extant, which had survived the, the entire time. And we say it survived, but as you point out, there's a constant process of, of uh, 
you know, uh, checking and restoration and maintenance where they will remove wood that's bad and, and replace it with better wood. And I spent uh, an afternoon with uh, Master Nishioka walking around, and he was pointing out to me, that beam there, that's original. That one there, that's original. This one was 500 years old. This one is just 200 years old. And he would show me, you know, this thing. So it's like a living organism. But the point is that when the building is built, when the temple is built, Nishioka is planning for it to last a thousand years. How do you have to build it for it to last for another thousand years? And when he would be criticized for spending 20, 30 years or so on this massive building project, he pointed out, you know, in this time scale of a thousand years from the trees and then a thousand years for the temple, this 2000 year time span, that's nothing. That's a spark. The human life is just a spark, you know, and rather than make that more meaningless, uh, the human, the carpenter is the link he is the person who will allow that time span to continue, to connect the previous life of the tree with its, its future life uh, within the temple. And, and it's very important to do that well, to do that as, as well as humanly possible. And this is the key. It's as, as well as humanly possible. So this later just exploded in my mind. And I remember visiting one day, and uh, I was so fortunate that he allowed me to look at his notebooks and actually allowed me to copy his notebooks where he was planning how to use the wood and, and drawing the things and the proportions and the measurements, etc. Uh, and I was looking at one and I said, Master, what, what are these drawings for? And he says, this is the Daikodo. And at the temple, there's many buildings. Um, there were the two the pagodas he built, and he built the kondo, uh, and built the, the gate and the surround, and he worked on the separate project that I documented in more detail called the Sanzo Inn. The Daikodo uh, I said, when do you think this will start? He said, ah, maybe after 10 years or so, you know, 10, 15 years. Now, he was already in his 80s, you know, and he was not in great health. I didn't understand yet that he actually was, was suffering with cancer, but he he was not in great health. I said, so, Master, this means that this work will continue after you're gone, right? You're preparing for the work to continue after you're gone. He said, yes, of course. You know, he had to do that work. And he would hand it off to his main apprentice, uh, uh, and that they would they would carry it on. So um, that was also mind blowing, you know, that he's thinking in in the the span of decades for these individual projects within the span of of, of centuries and millennia. And his life was just one role. He got the baton, was continuing. He'd hand the baton off, and he would be gone from the scene. And and yes, unfortunately, he died in 1995. Uh, before this Daikoda was completed and some of the other major buildings at Yakushi were completed. You did mention um, how pleased you were that he has gotten a lot of respect over the years, and even more so after he died. Uh, you notice people talking talking about him with respect, and, and hopefully his legacy is being carried on with his apprentice or his apprentices after him. Um, is anybody kind of carrying on his work now that he's passed? Yes, yes. You know, his main apprentice is a man named Ogawa, who uh, at the time when I was uh, researching at Yakushiji, uh, he was, Onishiok had sent him to do his own project. So he was not on the site uh, when I was there, but I've gotten to know him since then. He carried on. Uh, he has, a, his, his workshop is called Ikaruga Kobo. And um, and he uh, actually has uh, one workshop in Nara, actually near uh, uh, Horiji Temple, and then also one in uh, Tochigi. He's found more work uh, in in Kanto uh, and Tohoku than he's found in Kansai. So he's continuing, and he is a very inspiring figure. Uh, and uh, we've done talks together, and uh, you know, spent time together. Uh, and he is carrying on the tradition of the training. And, and in his case, you know, his carpenters, you know, they they kind of live together and and spend a lot of time together. And it's really, uh, again, I think this spiritual training is a is a big part of it. Uh, very very different from most. I mean, I've met many other um, people who are doing temple work, uh, who range from, you know, one good friend was sort of a dissolute party guy I knew in Kyoto who did beautiful work at like Daitokuji Temple and others beautiful work but he was he was not into the whole spiritual side although he really was he just wasn't admitting it uh, and uh, others who are really more business work a day uh, carpenters who are doing temple work um, but it is continuing although again unfortunately none of them are really having the opportunity 
to build major buildings or to build a compound. What's called a garan is a, is a temple compound, which usually would have, as I mentioned, uh, for instance, a pagoda, uh, a main hall, a golden hall, and some other buildings surrounded by a roofed corridor with a gate. This is a garan. And, and uh, this opportunity just doesn't exist now. Uh, so uh, it's difficult for them to continue in the same way, but keeping the spirit alive. I think Ogawa-san is definitely keeping the spirit alive. Uh, and it's interesting because when we talk, you know, um, I would talk, mention how kind Nishioka was to me. Grandfatherly, compassionate, uh, full of humor. Uh, also, you know, he would explain things, but he didn't waste words, you know. And, uh, and then Ogawa said, no, he was never like that with me. You know, he was strict uh, and critical <laughs> and, you know, uh, you know, aren't. So, so there, there's a, actually a very good film that was produced. I guess it's been five years already called Oni Nikike, Ask the Oni, uh, because Nishioka was called the devil of Horyuchi. Uh, and because he was known to have this temper and to refuse to bend. It has to be done this way. And in that sense, difficult for other people to deal with. And uh, so he was called the Oni. But, you know, I was fortunate. I didn't see that side. And and again, I wonder why, you know, he uh, was so receptive to my presence and, and willing to talk to me. Uh, but I think he understood that this was kind of getting to the end of the road uh, of, of this long tradition. Uh, and seeing that people from outside were interested uh, like me, and there's actually a Canadian uh, whom I've lost touch with who actually spent time there learning as a carpenter around the same time. So he says, wow, these foreigners are interested more so than most Japanese. You know, that's weird. Uh, maybe I should help them understand it. So I think that's his motivation for, for cooperating with me and helping me with my project. And uh, I just remember when I, I wrote the book, uh, published it, and, uh, and sent it to him, or I think I brought it to him, and he, he later sent me a letter, and he addressed it to, you know, Asby Brown Sensei. Uh, and I was almost in tears. Um, I thought he called me Sensei, you know? For him to call me a Sensei was, was like being anointed by, you know, the divine. And I was, you know, I, I should point out that I was still working on my master's degree at the time the book was published. The book was published before I finished my master's degree. And... Uh, and and he called me a sensei. So I thought, I mean, I didn't let it go to my head, but I think on the one hand, in Japan, anybody who writes a book is a sensei. You know? <laughs> on the other hand, I think he really appreciated what I had done and wanted to acknowledge uh, my effort and, uh, and the value of it. So that to me was very, very, very meaningful. That's great. Yeah, powerful and what great memories. Um, one of the things that, yeah. that I often I often talk about um, with other, even about remodeling old buildings, people who've renovated Minka or other traditional homes, is the fact that a lot of these buildings is so impressive that it's all fitted together like an amazing jigsaw puzzle and never used nails. And I think you mentioned this earlier, the reason for that is so it can be disassembled, it can be moved, it can be repaired easier. But you also mention in the book how once it's all fitted together, this is very hard for people to see all this intricate work. So can you talk about the joinery a bit while I show some of the beautiful pictures sure. of all that artwork? Like a lot of people, what first drew me to Japanese carpentry was the joinery. And I had, uh, you know, I mentioned that I was able to see some wonderful books, uh, you know, of Japanese temple building, etc., cetera, or, or traditional architecture, wooden architecture when I was university. There was maybe one book about Japanese joints, maybe one or two. There was almost nothing in English available. Um, but it was the beauty of that that, that first attracted me. And uh, at the time in the U.S., uh, this was the beginning of what we call the timber framing revival, where people in the U.S. were getting interested in building buildings that were built with joinery, as they had been built. 
uh, from from the ancient times well until the 19th century when in, in America they started to use uh, two by fours and, and mainly nailing things together. So there was a strong tradition in the U.S., in America, in Europe, certainly in England, of building things with joints. If you look at these old um, cathedrals or old, uh, you know, buildings, Tudor buildings in, in England, they're all put together with joints, mortises and tenons and pegs and this sort of thing. So there was a similar approach. And I was interested in that and was I had taught myself to do that. Um, mainly by going to the library at the university and finding old carpentry manuals from like the, the 18th and 19th century, uh, which would explain how to measure and, and make these things. And then we would go to look for old tools at uh, flea, flea markets and things. So I was already interested in that. And I looked at the Japanese joints that I saw in photos and I said, my God, these are absolutely exquisite. They are much more complex. They are thought out in a much more deep and thorough way where the the joint you know different parts of the shape uh you know it, it parts of it will 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 be made so that the the the, the pieces of wood won't be able to pull apart and then other parts will be so they won't be able to twist apart and and as you mentioned they would be put together without nails generally with wet wedges or pegs but i'll point out that this was also the case in in pre-industrial age in europe and and america as well mainly they were pegged pegged together uh, and this is largely because the cost of iron nails was was high and in japan especially iron was kind of a precious thing and and uh, they would minimize the use of it there were a few places specifically where they used large nails in the temple but generally it was it was mortised together and and not to get too geeky about the history but this comes mainly from china the tradition in japan basically evolved in China beginning millennia ago, beginning more than 1000 BC. Uh, with, in, in the Bronze Age, basically they're um, you know, learning to fit and carve these things, and they evolved in China, and, and Chinese carpenters came to Japan, and, and some came from Korea as well at the same time, in like the 6th, 7th century, and basically began the tradition in Japan. But it was beautiful stuff. The joints were the beautiful stuff, and I remember experimenting and trying to do some on my own uh, before I came to Japan and finding that to be really, really interesting. And I think a lot of people uh, like that. Uh, you know, that's the most fascinating part. But yes, that is the easy part. That is the least significant part. That's simply the mechanics from the point of view of the carpenter, of the well-trained carpenter. Those are just the mechanics. And the rest is the understanding that we were referring to before of what is the personality of this tree, of this piece of wood? How will it change? How shall I combine uh, two different pieces of wood, and and some of the oral teachings, uh, the kuden uh, from that Nishioka inherited, talk about that. Uh, basically, it's a, every tree has its own personality. You have to combine personalities. Building a pagoda is combining the personalities of the trees, uh, and then that is extrapolated into sort of what I call the management side, which I began to appreciate much later in life, which is uh, yeah, and in the same way. Uh, that you need to combine the personalities of the trees, you need to combine the personalities of the carpenters. And not everyone's going to be good at everything. You have to give them the work that's appropriate for them and 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 unite them. The, the, that is why the, the 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 master carpenter is the key peg of the whole thing. He has to unite them uh, because otherwise they'll all have their own way. And if a person becomes unable to unify uh, the crew of carpenters, then they should resign. They should stop. Uh, but anyway... Yes, the joints were the great part, but what I learned more was uh, more about how is the wood going to bend, how is it going to change, um, you know, how is the, the planing the surface, why is that better than sanding, you know, and because when you use sandpaper uh, or something, it frays the fibers of the wood and that makes it easier to absorb water, which is more likely to, to lead to uh, rot, but if you plane it with a Japanese plane, the cell walls are sliced off very cleanly and, and generally more resistant to absorbing water. So there's a lot of details like that. Um, and initially, when I asked for permission to document the work, I expected it would be kind of like, you know, simply the building process. And a, a lot of the book is that. A, be, a, a half of not more is documenting step by step from the wood to shaping the parts to, you know, uh, to assembly, etc. And to me, that's fascinating. And I wanted to do that in a very thorough way, uh, as detailed as possible, as informatively as possible. And I think I was able to do that. And I drew lots of drawings, you know, which uh, you know ultimately became a thing of mine to be able to illustrate my own books about architecture and like the Edu Environment book, uh, the same thing. Uh, and then lots of photographs. So uh, it really takes you through the entire process and describes tools and stuff. But the joints are fascinating. And... Um, 
you know, the more that I've learned about it, and, and I'm fortunate there are many good colleagues, uh, both Japanese and non-Japanese, um, and more people now, which, again, I'm really happy to see that, you know, when I came in 1980s, there were, there was almost nobody uh, outside of Japan who was interested in that or writing about it. Uh, but now there's a lot of people who are appreciating it. Uh, and, um, you know, generally other researchers have shown how like the evolution of tools have changed how the joints have been made, uh, or even the evolution of the measuring square called the sashigane, uh, which basically I think in the, the Kamakura period, certainly by the Heian period, maybe late Heian period, um, had evolved that it would allow people to calculate curves. So you had this subtle change in the curve of roof lines, et cetera, because of the evolution of the tools themselves. So they're all basically connected. Uh, we have some comments. Uh, Elizabeth says, so interesting. <coughs> Thanks for joining from Facebook. Um, Molly is joining from Periscope. Thanks for joining Molly. She says she's lucky to have inherited the carpentry tools her great uncle made and used. He was a blacksmith and forge the hammers and blades for the tools. Fantastic. Oh, yeah. Really what a fortunate good. person. Mm. Uh, Tina from Australia, yeah. joining from YouTube as well, says, fantastic, the architect in this house will love this book and watching this back later. Just purchase the book. Thanks, Tina. And, Thank you, uh, Tina. <laughs> Chuck says, I joined a bit late. I have always wondered about Sugi invading the countryside were they intended for building mm. houses good question uh that's an interesting subject we can talk about that uh, Shall we talk about that uh before before we go back to that mm -hmm. i really am interested mm -hmm. in the tools and i think since molly brought up yes. the tools let's talk about sure, the tools sure. a little bit how most of it is not using machinery it's hand hand yes. tools that's amazing yes yes yeah uh Again, uh, in the earliest period, you know, when, when, for instance, Yakushiji was built, and we'll talk about, you know, 7th century, early 8th century uh, AD, um, you know, there were not a lot of types of tools. They had, um, you know, chisels and later saws. They had some saws, basically. Uh, but a lot of the work, they didn't have actually planes like we consider Japanese. I should have brought one to show. Uh, it's a wooden block with a blade in it, and 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 that's a plane to surface the, to, to smooth the surface. But they use something called the yari ganna, which yari is a spear and kana is is basically plane. So it's sometimes translated as planing knife, uh, and um, uh, this is what was used to like uh, surface the wood to make the surface. And uh, this is a wonderful thing because that tool had basically disappeared. Uh, over the centuries as the, the Japanese wooden block plane became uh, the common thing to be used. And Nishioka, when, when he was working on Horiji Temple, you know, he looked at the, the surface of the wood and said, you know, if we want to do the same way, we have to have that tool. So he worked with tool makers to, um, you know, to, to reproduce that tool. And it took a while, but eventually we're able to, to reproduce uh, that tool and to start to use it. So one of the, the hallmarks of Nishioka's carpenters is that they're all very skilled in using this planing knife. And it leaves a beautiful rippled surface. Again, like the plane, it cuts the cells very cleanly so it doesn't absorb water, but it uses a, it leaves a very, very beautiful rippled surface. Um, and again... You know, the blades are the key part of, of Japanese tools, which require a, a blacksmith, a, a tool craftsman to make them. And they're made, you know, in a way it's very similar to Japanese swords or other uh, blades. Uh, it's a kind of, it's called damascening. Uh, it is, you know, layer upon layer upon layer. It's beaten, it's folded, it's beaten, it's folded, it's beaten, it's folded, uh, repeated heating, etc. So it's it's this beautifully layered type of steel, uh, which again, you know, Japanese swords is a remarkable thing. And, and you know, I was told that uh, one of the high points for Japanese tool making was the Meiji period. After the samurai were basically, you know, kicked out of, you know, kicked out of a job, um, there wasn't as much of a call for sword makers anymore. So a lot of former sword makers started to make carpentry tools. And some of the most beautiful high quality tools came from that period. Um, but one of the sh remarkable things to me was that uh, the Japanese bladed tools require two different types of steel, that the, the cutting edge needs to be a, a, a hard steel. It's called a hagane. Uh, 
Uh, and again, the same is true for Japanese swords. And this is the, the most difficult uh, steel to produce. Uh, and the back, the most of the blade, though, is, is a softer steel. It's called a jigane. Uh, and that is flexible. It's a bit softer and flexible so that when they hit hit the, the chisel, for instance, uh, if it wasn't flexible, it might be more likely to fracture, to crack. So this is the key to have the right kind of soft steel uh, in there. The hard steel, you know, is, of course, crucial, uh, but the soft steel is also important. And um, Nishoko told me that, you know, basically the old steel was better than the new steel. We have all this fantastic metallurgy now, uh, and it can make very, very good hard steel, uh, but it's hard to make that kind of soft steel anymore. Uh, and he talked about having uh, given uh, a nail that was used in the roof to hold the roof raft or a taruki of Horiji Temple to a tool maker. Uh, and he said, and the tool maker said, I think we can make a good uh, plain blade, a kanaha from this, uh, and and did, and it's a beautiful, beautiful blade. And he showed it to me, he still was using it at the time. Uh, and again, that's because that, that steel was kind of a, what we call a very, very rich ore that didn't need such a high temperature to melt uh, con consequently had a very, very good characteristic for, for that. Um, but there's many kinds, but basically, you know, there are hand tools. It's chisels, uh, planes, saws, and Japanese saws are wonderful. And this is interesting because uh, over the decades since I was interested in this, um, others have become interested as well. And one of the tools, the Japanese tools, that is now pretty common to find in the toolbox of like uh, cabinet makers overseas is Japanese uh, saws, uh, nokogiri. Uh, and the thing about the Japanese saws is uh, that they cut on the pull stroke. So a Western saw cuts on the push stroke. So it needs to be kind of thick so that it doesn't bend or bow when you're doing that. But the Japanese saw cuts on the pull stroke. And maybe some of the viewers know steel is very strong when it's in tension, when it's pulled. Uh, that's why thin cables can hold up bridges. So the, 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 the saw blade is very, very thin. That means that the slot, it's called a kerf. The slot that it leaves is very, very narrow. Uh, a, a, a Western saw will probably have like a three millimeter slot, but these can be like a millimeter or less. So this has become very, very well appreciated uh, in the rest of the world since like the 1980s. Um, another fascinating tool is called the chona. And I wish I had a, a picture of it. Maybe you have some. It's a, an ADZE, A-D-Z-E. Uh, this is one of the most ancient tools. It, it's the blade. It cuts like this, you know, uh, and and has a curved handle. And if you look at like um, tools from uh, the Stone Age, uh, Neolithic, Neolithic tools, you will often find ads is made of stone. And it's basically the same idea. This is a thing and you, you chop it. Uh, and and uh, it is a way to remove wood from the surface to shape like a log or something. And I was just astounded to watch these Japanese carpenters using this uh, chona. Uh, to basically take the big, uh, you know, they had this log and it had been roughly shaped into like an octagonal shape. And then they were using this adze to make it circular, you know, to make it round, chopping off the corners. And they're standing on top of the thing and they're wearing their, you know, light shoes. They're not wearing steel boots. I think one of your uh, other, uh, you know, someone you had on a couple of weeks ago was talking about this as well. It was amazing to watch how beautifully and carefully they were able to use this tool. Uh, which is again this ain't this a tool that goes back to the Stone Age, and the same for axes. Uh, Japanese axes are very beautifully designed. Uh, again, depending on the use, uh, they will use those also for for a lot of shaping work. Now, to be honest, there were power tools in the shop that were used for for big bulky jobs, uh, but once you know, just cutting the wood to be lumber. You know, but once it was cut to lumber, <laughs> then they would basically work it with hand tools. And it was very remarkable for me to, to watch that process. Yeah. I'm showing the axe work on the screen right now and mm -hmm. him standing on the mm -hmm. beam doing with a, yeah. an axe and how precise and beautiful the axe work is. It's absolutely amazing that they are so yeah. good with. And if you mess up, you really mess up, right? <laughs> well, you could you could lose lose a toe or something, uh, but again, this is, you know, um, I had found and it was it was interesting that people on the site, these carpenters, uh, they would wear the hard hats, you know, they would do that, uh, you know, while they were assembling the temple, you know, that was a, a big thing, but but generally, you know, they were trained to be very very careful, 
and accidents were very, very rare. I mean, I didn't see a single accident over the course of, 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 of 10 years, you know, uh, researching on this, on this stuff uh, there. Nothing like, nothing through a mistake, you know, uh, something like that. But again, you know, I wonder if it's really the best approach, but they were trained to do it that way. So very, very careful. Um, also, the just the design. As a, a person who trained mm -hmm. in architecture and design, uh, do you want to talk about mm -hmm. the layout and the planning and the design of the buildings a little bit? Sure. Uh, I, I think it's good to keep in mind that, um, as, as was the case in most traditions in Europe for for people who were building cathedrals, etc., there was not an architect. The arch, I believe, the architect came later. That the the, the chief craftsman uh, was actually the designer. And in the case of, of Nishioka, he was a designer as well. Most of his work was the design side and to, to find the lumber and to decide how to use each piece of each tree, each part of each tree uh, in the temple. So that was the bulk of his work. And again, this is largely inherited from the past. At this point, uh, generally these styles, um, you know, different eras of Japan, maybe the Kamakura era would be different from the earlier, you know, uh, uh, you know, what I call the Nara era or, or, or from later eras. They all have certain style, stylistic features uh, associated with them. Also, depending on which specific sect of Buddhism, Zen temples have certain features that you won't find in other temples, etc. Uh, and, and they need to be knowledgeable about this. But basically, you know, there's a, a, a lot of uh, systems of proportion that are involved with this. And I have a bunch of diagrams in the book uh, reflecting that, like, you know, the, the, the height of the column uh, depends on the, the its circumference, and then other details are sort of broken down from that. Uh, and I also took time to analyze the layout of this one compound uh, that we were actually were building at the time called the Sanzo Inn, and and realized that it had some uh, symmetries and things that um, were very hidden. Uh, sort of circular symmetries, uh, certainly grid symmetries, main axes, etc. And it was all this harmonious uh, proportional system with a certain amount of variation. Uh, but the main thing is that these were largely inherited. And um, in the case of the Hakuhogaran, where the, the Eden, the picture hall that I was documenting in most detail was, um, Nishoka worked with his great colleague and friend, uh, Otahiro Taro, who was an architectural historian and also a charming man, similar character to Nishioka. Uh, and they worked together uh, on the basic styles and proportions, and they did it in the style of the Kamakura period. And uh, so it's sort of based on those historical precedents. But the amazing thing is what Japanese arch architects and archaeologists know, Japanese uh, carpenters know, is you only need, to, if you know basically the the circumference of the column and maybe one or two other details you can reproduce the entire system because this was a system if you know just sort of one column and the spacing then you can predict and you can design the whole thing uh, in the harmonious way because each part is sort of generated the form and proportions are generated by the others so it's kind of a, a really beautiful thing uh, we only have a few more minutes. I know there's so much mm -hmm. more that we haven't talked about. Uh, is there any mm. favorite part of the the design or the book that you we haven't talked about you'd like to touch on? Well, you know, you touched on it earlier, the fact that the some of the most amazing things are invisible when the building's built, whether it's the joinery, whether it is the beams and the roof structure that is totally hidden when the building is completed. Uh, it's this interior life of the thing. And uh, to me, that was really magical to be able to see that uh, in terms of the building itself. Uh, and the rest, I guess, was the understanding of what human beings are capable of. And and I think I mentioned this in the book as well. Um, one day a carpenter said, Brown, son, you know, you're American. You're not even Japanese. Why do you care so much about this? And I said, you should understand what you're doing shows what human beings are capable of. This is the peak. This is the best uh, carpentry in the world. Uh, you're showing me and the rest of the world what humans can do. You're doing this for humanity. And that's why I value it. And he sort of went, mm. Not a whole adult, you know, like, oh, oh I see. <laughs> you know, he was pretty happy uh, to see himself in that context. So, How would you recommend, after going through this book, I'm definitely, next time I visit a temple, yep. I'm going to take so much more notice 
in all mm. of the design. I'm going to look up at the ceiling. Um, is there any other thing that you would recommend someone who wants to appreciate this more might look for? Well, there's a beautiful museum uh, in Kobe, the Takanaka Komiten uh, Carpentry Tools Museum. And actually, Master Nishioka's tools are there. Uh, the ones that are photographed in my book, he allowed me to spend a day examining and photographing his tools. Those tools are now in that collection. That's a beautiful museum. Well done for, for teaching people about uh, Japanese carpentry. So I recommend that very, very highly. Um, there's so many places to go, uh, just, just to go and observe. And and if you think of these things as as strength, that the build Japanese wooden architecture always reflects its structure it, on the outside. You can always see how this thing is working, you know. You, you just get a sense of the strength and as you become attuned to, you know, what is the load on this roof and why are these beams going out this way or why are these things curved, you know, this all is reflecting uh, structural strength uh, and also, you know, flexibility. So again, this other thing, Japanese buildings are generally very good in earthquakes. Uh, because of this uh, heavy mass on the top and they're built to be flexible. So uh, there's a lot to see. They speak to you. They speak to you and they tell you who they are and what they're about. And that to me is the most beautiful part. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Definitely something I'll be thinking about when I visit as well is where did the trees come from and what part of the mountain were they on and which tree is this? And you know, like that connection <laughs> with the forest for me is is just so interesting and something I'd never heard before. Thank you so much for yeah. giving us so much insight. This is wonderful. I hope that you'll join us well, again you, and JJ. talk about another one of your books in the future. <laughs> I'd be happy to. Um, you know, this is really, like I said, it's becoming a habit. We're enjoying, I'm enjoying this and I'm glad to have an opportunity to talk about these things. So That's great. Even though it was such a long time ago, you talk about this book, how it informed a lot of your later books or your later thinking. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. This, this was a m major shaping experience for me. This has sort of set the direction of my entire life uh, since then. So it was Wonderful. crucial. Well, what a great legacy that you're leaving for future generations through this book and all your great research. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, tomorrow at 5 p.m., we're talking about the graceful martial art of Aikido with some uh, instructors in Hiroshima. So please join us tomorrow at 5. Thank you so much, Asby. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.